Hello, friends. Welcome back to the While We're Waiting Hope After Child Loss podcast. I'm Jill Sullivan, your host and one of the co-founders of the While We're Waiting ministry. This is a podcast of stories, stories of devastating loss and grief and heartbreak and struggle, and stories of hope and healing and faith and, yes, even joy. Underlying every conversation is the hope we have in Jesus Christ, which makes it possible to not just survive the loss of a child, but to live well while we're waiting to see them again in heaven one day. You can learn more about our ministry and the free bereaved parent retreats we host by visiting our website at www.whilewe'rewaiting.org. Welcome to episode number 208. My friends Keith and Shonda Freer joined me today for a conversation that will continue over the next two episodes. They are the founders of Grief Hope, which is a Christ-centered ministry that provides education and support for bereaved parents through weekend retreats, online support, and other resources. They are also featured speakers at Our Hearts Are Home conferences for bereaved parents, and I have put links to both of those ministries in the show notes. Their daughter, Megan, very unexpectedly took her own life in 2018, and since that time, they've found themselves living in the mystery of God's sovereignty. They have a lot of wisdom to share, and I believe you'll be blessed by listening in. Hi, Keith and Shonda. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, well, thanks for having us. We appreciate the opportunity to share with you and your listeners here today. Yeah, I'm glad we have this time to visit together today. So let's get started by giving you an opportunity to just share a little bit about yourselves, tell us where you're from, and what life is like for you there. Yeah, um, we're from Indiana and have been married for 34 years and have two kids. Megan, uh, our oldest, went to heaven in 2018 at the age of 21, and Andrew is now 25 and getting married soon. Uh, I've spent almost 30 years in public service as a police officer, a firefighter, and an EMT. And my professional background's been in counseling and higher education, and I currently serve part-time at our church in care ministry. Um, We also serve bereaved parents through a nonprofit ministry. We'll talk about that later. Um, We have both been Christians since our childhoods, and our faith in Jesus has been central to our lives individually and as a family. Uh, We've had a strong marriage. Family life's always been really important to us, and we're very active in our church. We have a really large and strong community of uh, friends and family who support us. Wow, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you for your service, Keith. Um, After Brad's accident a few months ago, you know, I have a whole new respect for EMTs Mm -hmm. and what they do. So thank you for that. Thank you all. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, we're here today to talk about Megan. Uh, Would you tell us a little bit about her? Help us get to know Megan today. Yeah, Megan was generally uh, very happy and lived a wholesome, well-rounded, full life. She loved adventure. She was creative and artistic. She loved people and her friends. She was active in school and church and extracurricular activities. She wanted to be involved in so many things, but couldn't do them all. Um, She really loved uh, uh, being active with things and and activities and stuff like that. So um, she enjoyed her life and had a lot of fun. She participated in theater in uh, high school and played the role of Lucy in The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe Mm -hmm. and the lead role in Annie as well. Mm -hmm. Um, She played soccer in junior high and high school and played on intramural soccer teams in college. And she loved all animals. She especially loved horses and dogs. Um, She had a contagious laugh and she was our family's entertainment director. So (laughs) we raised her in a Christ centered home, like we've said, and she accepted Jesus at a really young age. And she even led her brother uh, in a prayer to accept Jesus when they were very young. So her faith was really important to her. Um, She spent a lot of her extra time, what she had spending it growing in and learning more about Jesus. Um, She served for several summers at a Christian camp. She was involved in several children's ministries at our church. She did a scripture engagement project in college. Uh, She was a deep thinker, and she loved to talk about theology and philosophy and wrestle with the questions and issues of life. She really loved people, and she wanted to spend 
time with them in very intentional, relational ways, mostly to encourage each other in their Christian walks. And usually that was over a cup of very sweet uh, caramel flavored coffee. (laughs) Uh, She enjoyed learning about other cultures. She double majored in Christian ministries and Spanish in college. Uh, She went on mission trips to Mexico and Ecuador and then spent a semester abroad in Spain. And of course, those were all helping her learn Spanish, too. She was considering full-time missions after college, and she had um, secured a summer internship working in children's ministry in the Chicago area. She was really committed, uh, and we believe spiritually gifted in evangelism, and uh, she was interested in discipleship, and she truly wanted to share the love of Jesus with the world. Yeah, she sounds like a remarkable young woman. Mm, She was wonderful. Yeah. Um, We have a lot of memories from vacation experiences. Uh, A favorite memory is that when she was in Spain, uh, we got to visit her on spring break. And we all met in Switzerland to spend a a week with um, other friends there. And uh, basically, that was friends from our college uh, years. And we were also able to go and visit France and Germany at that time. Mm. Uh, It was really a trip of a lifetime, and it Mm. was fun to see Megan experience it all. So, And before she left for that semester in Spain, one of my favorite memories is that she wrote about 30 notes, each with her really artistic flair, hid them around our house to surprise us. And it t- she hid them well. It took us almost the whole semester to find all of them. Um, but we And we didn't know she had done it. So we started finding them, and then it was a scavenger hunt. But we still have the one. We, we saved all of them. But oh, sure. the one that she left on our treadmill is still there. And um, she just drew a big heart and wrote underneath it, the picture speaks for itself. So she was oh. really thoughtful. Yeah. I love that. Wow. She sounds like somebody I would really have enjoyed getting to know and sitting down and having conversations with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She did we enjoy did. that, talking <laughs> yes. with a lot of people. Yep. Yes, yep. that is great. So in the spring of 2018, she was a college student. Why don't you just pick up the story from there? Yeah, uh, our story really starts in April of 2017 when we returned from Switzerland Um, Megan returned to Spain to finish her semester, and Sean and I went back to Indiana. Uh, The day after we returned home, our son had a life-threatening brain bleed that he spent uh, the next three weeks in ICU and underwent brain surgery. Megan finished her semester and returned home to Andrew's for Andrew's surgery. Um, They both rearranged summer plans um, to be home for the summer together. Uh, They were very close and wanted to be together. Uh, Andrew fully recovered over the summer and started his freshman year of college. And Megan returned to campus to start her junior year. They lived in the same dorm, and he was on the first floor, and she was on the second floor. Hmm. Yeah. So that transition from Spain back to campus and dorm life was challenging for Megan. Um, She had enjoyed her independence in Spain and even at home over the summer. And it was just hard to return to that ordinary college routine. Um, It was her junior year, and that was a hard, harder, more rigorous academic schedule. But she worked hard. By the holidays, she had begun talking to us about changes that she wanted to make for the spring semester. And after a lot of discussion and prayer, she had decided that she would live at home. We live about 30 minutes from campus. Um, And that way she could get involved in some other things away from campus that she was interested in. She needed to do an internship over the summer. She had ideas of what she wanted to pursue. And she had already made plans then for her senior year um, to be near campus with some friends in an apartment. Uh, so the academic load she knew would be lighter, actually, that senior year. She did go on a mission trip to Ecuador in January. This is January of 2018, and that went really well. Um, She settled into the spring semester in February and March, and things seemed to be going well. She did secure that summer internship, and she was looking forward to it. Then over spring break, she had some increasing anxiety that we just hadn't seen before, and neither she nor we could identify the source. She didn't have a mental health history. Um, So over the next six weeks, we were in constant communication with her about it, and um, she 
had a physical and a psychological workup that revealed nothing. She started seeing one of the campus counselors, and we were in daily communication with her, Keith and I, and she continued to function while she was participating in all of her daily routines. To us, uh, there did seem to be some spiritual oppression. Um, we talked about that with her and some spiritual issues, but again, it didn't seem terribly unusual for her stage of life and some mm -hmm. of the things she was wrestling with through her classes. Sure. Um, we didn't see the issues as anything abnormal and just fully thought that she would work through them in time. And then on May 9th, she died by suicide. So it was a complete and utter shock, not only to us, but to our entire community. Uh, we're very close to that campus community and no one saw it coming. Yeah. That's so difficult when something like that happens and there is no way that you could have known. No signs, no symptoms. That's, that's so difficult. My heart goes out to you in that. You know, I always take notes when people share their stories at our retreats, and I wrote down something you said. You said, some Christians lose the battles, but we know who wins the war. What did you mean by that? Uh, scripture repeatedly tells us that there is an active spiritual war going on and that Satan will attack Christians. Yeah. Ephesians 6 tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It also tells us that Satan schemes and attacks with fiery arrows. Mm -hmm. First Peter 5 says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And in John 17, Jesus prays, for his disciples and ask God to protect them from the evil one. So Jesus himself was tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. That's a long time, especially for the Son of God, who could have ended it in seconds. Sure. Um, so we know that spiritual warfare is real and that Satan is a powerful adversary. We also know that Jesus has the ultimate victory. He has the victory over death and over Satan and we take great comfort in that. Mm -hmm. so. And we, we don't want to negate the reality of mental illness. We live right. in a fallen world, and our brains can become sick like any other organ. And maybe there was some underlying mental health issue that Megan was beginning to deal with. We just mm -hmm. will never know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but after all the analysis of what happened, and we could talk for hours about all of that analysis with so many people, including Bible scholars. Um, we, it also seems to us that Megan was under some type of spiritual attack. And either way, she lost the battle. But we know 100% that Jesus had the ultimate victory. And we know she trusted Jesus as her Savior and that she was immediately ushered into the presence of Jesus. Um, and we know we'll see her again. Mm -hmm. And that brings us great, great hope. Yep. Yes. Amen. So do you feel that there are issues that a parent who loses a child to suicide has to deal with that maybe complicate the grief journey a bit? And if so, what are those issues and how have you dealt with them? This probably has been one of the biggest questions that we've wrestled with. And we wrestled with it deeply and significantly for the first couple of years. I would not say it's 100% resolved in our minds, um, even now, and I don't know if it will be this side of heaven. There's a lot of mystery to it. Initially, it felt like suicide loss must be so unique and so devastating but the more that we have interacted with bereaved parents who have lost children of all ages, of, by all means, it has become more and more difficult for us to identify something unique to suicide that other parents haven't experienced also. And by that, I mean guilt, some trauma, shame, uh, a helplessness the woulda, coulda, shouldas, what ifs, that we want it undone, that we would have laid down our life for our kids. Those aren't unique 
to suicide loss. That's right. So again, wrestling with it, trying to parse out, is there a uniqueness? There certainly seems to be a stigma around suicide loss. Gratefully, in our community, we just, we didn't experience that. But I know that others have. And even if not imposed by others, there still is even maybe a self-imposed stigma um, that still exists. And, and by that, I mean, maybe a concern that our child and for us, for that Megan or us or our parenting or our family life, you know, a presumption. It's a fear that others may think there's something horribly wrong some hidden secrets or something we didn't know about. So I I do, you know, I do remember feeling like I have a big scarlet letter on my head, you know, that screams suicide loss in the beginning. Um, I think that was self-imposed. Others weren't putting that on me. If anything, others were reassuring us otherwise. What I've boiled it down to and, and, Keith can speak to this too, is the only difference that seems really unique to suicide. And and even then, I'm not sure that there may be some other types of losses that would say this too, maybe homicide, maybe addiction, I'm not sure, is that there's a human's involvement in the death. Sure. And that starts to get into some really thick weeds on theology about human agency and God's sovereignty and and things like that. What we do know is from a human medical standpoint, it seems like our son should have died, quote unquote. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't. The Lord restored him to full health. Megan didn't have any mental health history, had this full happy life. And from a human standpoint, it seems like she should have lived. Yeah. But she didn't. And we could talk for a long time about this. Um, someone said early on to me, in fact, I read it uh, in a well-respected author's book, that the means are incidental. And that really got me thinking because I thought suicide loss does not feel incidental. But yet again, no means of death seems incidental to the survivors of that loss. We all die. So what what it has meant for me is trying to deal with these paradoxes, thinking about life and death, that our days are ordained for us before we were born, that Jesus holds the keys to death in the grave, and there will always be a mystery to me in Megan's death in particular, and maybe in suicide loss in general, I'm, I'm not sure. But I know I don't need to spend my days trying to prevent death or being consumed with the means of death. And I believe we'll live the exact number of days that have already been determined. And I think that gives me great freedom in just choosing to trust God with the number of my days and Keith's days and Andrew's days. And that includes Megan's days. Mm-hmm. I don't know the purpose of the means, and there's a part of me I think there must be (laughs) purpose and means, but I am convinced more than ever that God alone has authority over life and death, and that has brought me a lot of comfort just to trust in His sovereignty in that, and, and again, the hope of heaven, and just knowing that suicide, not there's nothing that separates us from the love of God. That's right. Including life and death and, mm-hmm. and the means of death. And so knowing that one day all will be made new and all will be restored and all will be made right. That helps a lot. Well, I don't know what to add to that. I think Shonda <laughs> that was pretty thorough. That, that was excellent. very well. And uh, it's pretty much been the experience that we have shared together on this journey of grief. Um, that we have had together. So, um, yeah, I really don't have much more to add on that point. So, yeah. Well, thank you. As we're recording this episode, you've just passed the six year mark since Megan went to heaven, but think back if you can to those very early days of your grief, 
What advice would you give to that person who's listening right now who's at the very beginning of their grief journey? Um, just to know it's okay to grieve. Give yourself permission to grieve. And it doesn't have to be done a certain way. Um, we're all individuals. We all have different personalities. We're going to have all have different ways to grieve our loss. And please, as a, a friend, a family member, a spouse, respect the other's way of grieving. And I think it's a great time to show grace and, and patience to each other as we do that. So being a man, um, sometimes men, it's hard to grieve. Some of us bottle it up and we don't... Uh, want to share. And I would really discourage that. Um, I see it's healthy to be able to talk, to be open, to maybe listen to your spouse going through the same thing. And again, I know it's, we, uh, we grieve differently. So maybe some guys won't have a whole lot to say, but it is, um, therapeutic, um, men to be able to, uh, say something, to release some emotion, to cry. I've cried. I never was a big crier before this happened, but um, now I can, especially, you know, thinking of my loss and, and maybe the loss of other people too. So, so that's some things I'd recommend. And one other big thing that was helpful for me, I have uh, a near 50 minute commute to work. So I really found some Christian songs that uh, were important to me, and um, I, I got a hold of the lyrics to them as well. So I would listen to them, and sometimes going to or from work, cry about it. Um, but at some time, look at the lyrics and, and go through them as well. So um, I just think it's 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 good to uh, come up with a healthy uh, coping mechanism for each individual person, and not be afraid to. Uh, work through and share the emotions. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, I guess I would say to a newly bereaved parent is, first of all, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it can seem that way. And um, hopefully if the listeners listening to this uh, have already had some experience with while we're waiting and, and at least can get an idea now that, that they aren't alone. But you're not alone. Some of my early first year was even searching scripture for examples of child loss. And there really are many uh, when, when you start looking at that. So that's one of the things that helped me feel not so isolated. And then just, I, Keith's alluded to it too, but just this takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time to process. This is a significant loss. And I like to equate it to an ICU stay. If you are physically injured, there is a trauma that takes great time and rehab, and you all know that well. Yes. Um, it, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And just like you would physically have to recover from a great trauma that will take weeks and months or, or years, and sometimes there'll be after effects, give yourself space and time. And for us, that had to be intentional. We made plans every day, and we can talk about that in a minute too, of what are we going to do today that helps us on this grief journey? And I would just say, as hard as it is, it's hard to it's hard to formulate prayers in the beginning. It was for me. Um, it was hard to read scripture. I just couldn't. I didn't have the concentration to attend. And I was a daily Bible reader. So pray when you can. God knows your heart. Audio, I, I started for the first time in my life listening to audio scripture. It just helped that somebody was reading it to me, yes. so I didn't have to follow the words on a page. Music, the Psalms, and then staying connected to church, and that sometimes is so hard and so painful, but find ways to continue to attend church, even if it's in and out after the service starts and leave before it ends. You know what? We could talk for a long time about that too, but it's so critical to stay connected to the body. Mm -hmm. That for me was one of the hardest things was going back to church. Yeah, It yeah. really was. So I'm glad to hear you say that. And I'm glad 
on my own, I'm not sure when I would have gone back, to be honest with you, but Brad was the one, you know, spiritual leader of the home. He brought us back to church and boy, I went kicking and screaming some Sundays, but I'm so glad we persevered and and did do that because we were able to stay plugged in and connected. And um, I do think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's this, I, you know, I don't know, fear. It, there's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. We're still so vulnerable yes. and the, the tears and then for us, the music elicited that emotion and, you know, figure out ways with friends or family. If you need to leave, go to the bathroom and cry. Don't be there for the music if that's bothering mm-hmm. you or just cry. It's okay. You, the number of people that told us in year two, Thank you for showing up. You being at church was a witness to us. And that was not our intention. We were hanging on for dear life. So there is purpose and blessing for the whole body when we when we choose to suffer together and not just go to church when we feel good. Absolutely. And who is going to teach the church about grieving but us? You know, yeah, they can learn from us. Yeah. So how do you feel like your grief in this sixth year compares to that first or second year? You just referred kind of to year two there. How has your grief evolved over time? Um, yeah, the first year um, was total devastation. I felt that the world should have stopped, but it never did. And that was huge. Another thing, I was just kind of baffled you know, just kind of set back a little bit with my faith, like, God, I thought maybe you promised that, you know, uh, a couple seeking a good Christian life, there wasn't going to be a whole lot of problems and bumps in the road and that type of thing. And, uh, you know, so it was, uh, it's still kind of a mystery, you know, why, why this happened. And, uh, I'm really having to really trust um, in the Lord. You know, I said before, you know, I do trust in the Lord. Well, hey, this is really making me make that decision. Do I really trust him? So again, in the beginning, um, it was just raw, raging and overwhelming grief. The enemy attacked us with uh, second guessing and false guilt, along with the would have, could have, should have, as mentioned before. Um, I prayed and lamented a lot and um, basically denounced Satan's attacks because, you know, you're so vulnerable at that time and he's going to come back and, you know, try to attack you and say, well, you caused this or it was your fault or any and all of those types of little sayings. So you just have to, you know, denounce them and uh, know who you are in Christ. So, uh Christian music, again, about grief, loss, and hope was important to me. Um, I was finally able to come to a point of managing my grief by processing it um, between my humanity and my faith. And um, just try to articulate that a little bit. Um, I can compartmentalize um, pretty well. Um, Some people can, some people can't. This might be helpful to some, but not all. But, um, you know, I can deal with that grief and like I said, it was uh, it was raw and it was raging and stuff like that in my humanity. But, uh, hey, I know who I am in Christ. I have a faith. I know the promises he's given me. And I need to grasp onto that. And I need to believe those promises in my head over my heart or however you want to look at that, vice versa, whatever, you know, know what God has said and then take it to heart um, and try to override those negative or those um, questioning emotions in the heart and replace those with firm foundational promises God has given us. So um, there are... uh, Basically, um, other aspects of grief that have been difficult from the beginning and have changed somewhat over time, uh, but they're still there. Some things that I experience, you know, physical things is just brain fog, forgetfulness, (laughs) Um, being slower in my thoughts and my actions than what I used to before. 
And I guess that's kind of a common thing with some people. So um, different priorities and motivations have changed, and uh, I've become a little more reserved. I'm more of uh, the adventure kind of extrovert type thing, so I've kind of connected in with being a little more introvert and uh, a little more reserved at times and stuff like that. So just a little bit of a, a difference that, uh, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, it's, it's who I am now. And that's right. what God's given me. So yeah. uh, it's, it's been good. So. I love what you said about balancing your humanity with your faith, because that's what we do as bereaved parents. You know, there's that human part of us that is just so broken and raw and questioning and wondering why and all of those things. And then there's our faith. And we've got to find that balance between the two. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Shonda? Yeah, I would say in the beginning, we, you know, it was so raw. I used to tell people that first year. I, I just feel like someone has literally, I had a physical sensation like a hot poker had been stabbed through my heart. Yes. Um, I told a friend of mine, I feel like a, a grenade's blown up on my chest and I'm just walking around with my guts spilled out, you know, mm-hmm. that everybody can see. Um, and she said, one day that will heal up. And I thought at the time, never, you know, but she was right. So I did cry every day for the first year um, and a few months beyond. It was just like a faucet I could not turn off. And um, I had a few medical issues develop that first year. Nothing serious, but nothing I would have ever connected to a grief response. Um, And my doctors who had been with us for 20 plus years at that point, including our kids, connected the dots. So I started paying a little bit more attention to my body um, and my physical symptoms. We made a decision in the first couple weeks that we weren't, well, really the first couple of days, we never did, that we weren't going to stay in bed, you know, that we were going to get up every day. We were going to have some intentionality in it. We were able to take some time off work um, with FMLA, and we really focused on the grief processing. Um, We'd just get up at our regular time every day, We'd make this little short to-do list of normal household duties, and if we got them done, fine, and if we didn't, fine, but it kind of gave us a place to start. Just chose one or two things a day to focus on that was grief-specific, like maybe reading a book or listening to something or um, going through Megan's things or talking to a specific person um, about her life and death. Um, We spent a lot of times outdoors. It was summertime in Indiana, so that was nice, and took a walk. I said, the Lord... That was a gift because had it been in the middle of January and winter, that just would have been so much more depressing. Our appetites did decrease, but we just forced ourselves to eat uh, breakfast and a mid-afternoon meal. And I started, I I had to find a way to um, help me fall asleep and stay Mm -hmm. asleep. Um, So I began listening to instrumental hymns, um, which I had never done before. And I I still do that today. It just became a habit. and, And I like that. We stayed in church. We talked about that. And really that first year was just so consumed with trying to make sense of her death. As year two came along, and it wasn't a switch that shut off, you know, but somewhere in the second year into the third, um, and each year since, just slowly, subtly began to notice that grief hasn't been all consuming. I still cry sometimes, uh, and it can be on the anniversary things like birthdays and holidays in her Death, death anniversary, but it can also be I smell something or I see something or I'm in a store that she liked. So I can still get choked up or, or cry, um, still miss her and think of her every day. I'd say now it's a dull ache of missing her that's always there and just runs in the background that sometimes I'm aware of consciously and sometimes I'm not, but it's just under the surface. If, if I attend to it at all, I I know it's there, but it's not this sharp, inconsolable pain. I say as times pass, grief's become like this familiar companion instead of a foreign invader. I just imagine my grief as this backpack filled with rocks that I've been forced to carry every day since she died. And at first, the weight just seemed impossible to carry, and it, it almost crushed me. I, I just thought, I'll never be able to carry this load. But God's continued to give me the strength, us the strength to carry it. Um, doesn't feel as crushingly heavy as it did now in the beginning. And 
I'm just, I resigned. I, I almost said content, but that's not the right word. I'm just, I've just accepted that this is a cross we will be asked to bear until the other side of heaven. This concludes the first half of my conversation with Keith and Shonda Freer. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to sharing the rest of our chat with you next Wednesday.